social capital. Thank you. Yeah, I have a science fiction book club, actually, that I started at Borders Bookstore when it used to exist. <laughs> and uh, we meet monthly, and that is just one of the highlights of my life. We barred Wheaton people from joining. Two of us Wheaton people started it. I, there were so many Wheaton people that wanted to join it, and we said, you cannot. This is not for us. Uh, this is to have engage around science fiction and engage people uh, around Jesus, who may not know him yet, so we've had a blast doing it. I get to talk about evangelism uh, and unity, and evangelism and division, and uh, deep passion of my heart, uh, and so I'm just going to jump right in, but I am going to pray. Lord, I do thank you for the call uh, all of us in one way or another in this room have to evangelism and to be bridge builders. And I pray that uh, you might work tonight yes. in our hearts and in our lives to equip and encourage us in the ways that we teach evangelism and model evangelism and encourage evangelism to be collaborators and bridge builders. We pray in your name. Amen. 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 In his book, Models of the Church, Avery Dulles quotes Catholic I think I'm going to get my PowerPoint up, though. Okay. Catholic Bernard Lonergan, in relation to the unity of the church. The church has three functions, said Lonergan. Cognitive, over which most division occurs. Constitutive, based on the hidden gift of the Holy Spirit and the love of Christ and effective by directing efforts toward bettering people in the world through witness and service. The latter two form the basis for the unity that does exist, constitutive, and can be achieved, effective. Ultimately, Christian unity is eschatological. I found this quote by Lonergan to be very interesting. <coughs> Ideas and theology, the cognitive, also social location, lots of things divide us, often divide. What helps churches work together and come together is the constituted, that we're knit together by the Holy Spirit, who lives in all of us. And we often experience that, right? We pray with somebody from some denomination, we didn't think they even knew Jesus, and they love Jesus, and their life is marked by the Holy Spirit. And suddenly we find ourselves trusting and being connected to someone that we didn't trust before. And also, what bridges people is the effective, or the strategic uh, ministry, uh, common cause work to better the world and to be a witness to Christ. So evangelism, then, is one arena in which the church can often come together around common cause. And in that way, we fulfill Jesus' prayer to make us one that the world may know the Father that has sent the Son. That John 17 prayer, where our unity is our witness. And that way, we stop being the scandal we've too often been with our many and intolerant and unattractive divisions, sometimes over what seem to be important issues, often over worship style or dress, or whether we dunk or drown people for baptism, and even for things that can seem much more trivial. But when we come together, we can also strategically reach people and have a larger impact on the world. I know of a group of 10 churches across a wide denominational spectrum in Gurney that started sharing their mailing lists and decided to reach Gurney together. And when they put all their mailing lists together, they found they had people on every block in the entire city. And if they could find ways to, and that's what they're doing now, finding ways to help them become missional communities, they're training them together, and they're actually reaching out in every neighborhood in the entire community. And that's the power of that kind of working together. So evangelism and witness can often be a source for social bridges and impact and building social capital in the church. Social capital is the value of uh, networks, and relationships. It's 
So social connections and social at, uh, networks are a valuable asset. They help us do more for ourselves, others, our communities, and for God's mission in the world. Three kinds of social capital, bonding, bridging, linking. Bonding is among white people. Bridging is among different people. Linking is among people of different economic and social uh, situations. And we're especially talking tonight about bridging, denominational bridging, racial bridging, across the kinds of boundaries that divide our society. So evangelism can be that kind of bridging vision and practice. It can be the cause that connects and the tie that binds and increases our social capital. But sometimes evangelism becomes the flashpoint, the issue, that because of our methodology or our approach or our different slant on the message or the way we go about it, that uh, we like and other people are offended by, sometimes it becomes the flashpoint for division, doesn't it? For critique, for hostility toward each other. And uh, it can pull us apart. I think it's a key issue for the academy because in the academy we get to invest in future leaders of the church. And are we teaching evangelism in ways that prepare leaders to work together across denominational, economic, and racial boundaries? Are we giving them an appreciation for the different modes and methods of evangelism? so that they build up the church and increase her social capital. Can we take those methods of evangelism that we hate and find something good to build bridges? Too often, we argue about evangelism more than engage in evangelism. The church often gets bogged down or derailed by that division and argument. Sometimes we spend more time criticizing each other's view as one uh, intervarsity leader, I, I've been shaped a lot by parachurch uh, movements. As one intervarsity leader put it, Paul Little, who was director of evangelism, I was national coordinator some 30 years later of evangelism for intervarsity, he said, you know, when intervarsity staff were spending more time criticizing Campus Crusade, another campus ministry, we spent a lot of time criticizing their way of doing evangelism. <coughs> And Paul Little uh, said, I like the way Campus Crusade does evangelism a lot better than I like the way we don't do evangelism. And I think too often, and I realize we could argue even the phraseology, do evangelism. We could argue about that. Is that a helpful way to talk about evangelism? But we can end up in that critique that paralyzes. And we can actually feel good about ourselves for having a great critique of evangelism rather than promoting a good way forward, and rather than building social capital, uh, rather than building bridges, rather than erasing the scandal of a divided church, a hostile church, and a polarized church. So do we prepare our students to argue and critique more than engage and appreciate? It's the basic question I want to ask. Do we prepare our students to argue and critique more than engage and appreciate. That's what I want us to reflect on tonight. As an aside here, I've chosen to focus on how we pursue and practice evangelism. I could focus on, on, on our message. Actually, I had a whole section of this paper that I really loved, that I jettisoned because I want to stay within time and give us plenty of time to talk and not put you to sleep, but I loved it. <laughs> the message we preach. Is there a way to integrate the battles we're having, to transcend some of the battles we're having? I also had another whole section of the paper on different understandings of evangelism out of the discipline of the field of communication, the discipline of communication. Communication could actually reframe the way we talk about evangelism because there are a number of different traditions and theoretical traditions in communication, from the rhetorical to the psychosocial to the uh, cultural, uh, uh, to cultural traditions, to uh, critical traditions. And many of uh, the ways we talk about evangelism, we talk about it theologically and methodologically, but we don't really look at the nature of communication and holistic communication. And I could have gone there, but that also got jettisoned. And I decided to focus on one particular kind of thing what is evangelism and how ought we to engage in evangelism? And I want to look at it in two ways. I want to look at it through the lens of history 
and talk about some models. Have some of you engaged with some of uh, Billy Abraham's work, uh, The Logic of Evangelism? Has anybody engaged with that? A few of the professors have. It's a good one as a professor to engage with. And I want to build on some of what he's done in the lens of history as he sort of uh, summarized the number of models over these last 50 years. And I'm going to add some to that. And then I'm going to look at it through the lens of culture. And here's where I'll be sort of walking out onto thin ice. I'm going to try to uh, reframe Niebuhr a little bit uh, and deal with some of the critiques that have uh, re really justified critiques that have been made of Niebuhr. Um, but at the same time, still, even though it'll be a little bit of thin ice, and I realize I, as I listen to our introductions, there's a lot of uh, Methodists here, which is wonderful. I love Methodists. And I almost went to Garrett for my PhD when you offered one. And, uh, but, uh, but I realize that it'll be interesting to see how, as I talk about culture, how that connects with your framework and your life experience. But I'm going to offer some humble suggestions about what I think often divides us more deeply. It's often our posture toward prevailing cultures that divide us. Maybe sometimes even more than our theology and our ideas. And I want to unpack that a little bit. So those are the two lenses that we'll uh, take a look at. So uh, what is evangelism? Let's look at it through the lens of history first. I want to talk about just uh, seven models. Uh, William Abraham suggested five and kind of gave strengths and weaknesses. Um, but this is a way to talk about the different paradigms people have had for what evangelism is and how we engage. And again, my main thrust for the evening is, are we helping our students become those who engage and appreciate? or merely critique. So I want to talk about those and then remind us of Billy Abraham's way of sort of integrating those. Um, he suggested five prominent uh, traditions of evangelism. And then I think there's at least two more. And then I'm anxious to see if uh, you would add others, but at least two more. So evangelism is proclamation. is the first tradition in the church of what evangelism is. And here that the focus is on communication as a message, irrespective of results. Billy Graham immediately comes to mind. His crusades might be the most, one of the more visible examples of this view lived out in the 20th century. I would suggest many times when we teach evangelism, we can tend to dismiss this, and for some good reasons, but we can tend to say that's old fashioned, it had its day, it's no longer really relevant. It's been very interesting to me at university to work with a fellow, a guy named York Moore, who's an African-American evangelist within a university, who actually is running crusades, uh, not, but he doesn't call them that, of course, and I wouldn't either. It's a, you know, not a happy name today, but he runs uh, outreaches on campuses called Price of Life Campaign, and puts together sex slave trafficking and preaching the gospel in a wonderful and a powerful way, and hundreds and even thousands of people come out and respond. I think sometimes we dismiss the ways people have pursued evangelism uh, because uh, partly our prejudices, partly for some good, re good critique, and partly because nobody's really thought of a good way to pursue this model in our <coughs> contemporary context. Uh, so evangelism is proclamation. I think uh, one of the strengths of that is it's very rooted in, in the sort of words. Euangelizai, uh, kerosai, uh, Margarine, words in scripture for evangelism that have a strong verbal focus. I think uh, it also reemphasizes or encourages that um, sense that the message itself, when proclaimed faithfully, can be, by the Holy Spirit, driven into hearts and bring conviction. And people can respond. And dependence on the message, the gospel, the good news, is the power of God for salvation. I think it has some problems, too. It's often divorced from any local church context. It's often a message that's preached that has no social ethical content. There are serious questions to ask about that model, but also profound things to affirm. 
And I would hope that as we teach people in evangelism, we have that attitude of critique that strengthens and that celebrates the diversity while indeed we must critique. So evangelism is proclamation. Uh, Billy Graham is a great example. I had an experience of working with a Billy Graham outreach at University of North Carolina Chapel Hill. I was one of the staff for it, and we met in a room I remember. You know, the, the guy just had that voice and that tone of voice that could convince you that whatever he was saying, I mean, even if he said, the sun is shining outside, you just knew it was one of the most important things in the world. And I remember listening to him with a small group of people, and he, he just said, uh, you know, he said, I tell people in reaching out and in living our lives, I tell them there are three important things. Number one is prayer. Number two is prayer. <laughs> Number three is prayer. You know, the first thing is prayer. The second thing. And I tell you, I just, as we walked out shaking his hand, I just felt like I'm going to pray first, pray second, and pray third, because there was a compelling, really a blessing of God on him to have that kind of humility, authenticity, and authority in the proclamation of the gospel. So that's uh, one model. Secondly, evangelism is converting individuals. Uh, so just to say a couple more things about Graham, it was an amazing way that he did build bridges. A lot of people don't know that he had Martin Luther King uh, start one of his uh, meetings during his 1957 uh, Madison Square Garden uh, outreach. He was the first major evangelism to desec major evangelist to desegregate his meetings in the South. And he, over time, grew in his appreciation of justice and compassion and peace and nonviolence. And I think there's something about people who have that role and pursue that model. Well, secondly, evangelism is converting individuals to the Christian faith. Here the emphasis is on certain religious experiences or intellectual operations soul winning efforts, historical revival movements. I think the key, one of the key insights for this model is we must be born again. Nobody's born into the kingdom by physical birth. Everyone needs to be born by spiritual birth. And I think that's a powerful insight. I think at the same time it has its problems. Again, divorced from the church, often divorced from any kind of social ethic, often a purely pietistic view of what conversion is. It has its problems, but it's also powerfully enriched our understanding of evangelism. Third model, evangelism is church growth and planting. The primary concern here is uh, the incorporation of converts into local fellowships of believers. The church growth, seeker church, and multi-site movements all illustrate this approach well. I love that they put the church back in the center. I love that it's evangelism that's connected to the church in a way that people are incorporated into the kingdom. They're incorporated into the local church. At the same time, this church planting, church growth, I hang out with a lot of these guys. I'm going to a lot of the conferences like Exponential and some of the others. I am some, my breath is sometimes taken away by how pragmatic it is. The, the kind of conversations about, you know, excuse me, I heard one of them really talk about this, but butts and bucks and buildings. And it all becomes, that's what evangelism is. And that's the measure of its success. And so again, that pragmatism, has serious problems, but what a help, what an enrichment to our understanding of evangelism. So evangelism fourth model as recruiting and making disciples. Many of the parachurch groups have taught this uh, and traditionally focused here, recruiting and making disciples. And there's a key insight. The Great Commission does not call us to collect converts, right? It calls us as we're going to make disciples. The measure of evangelism <clears throat> is the way in which disciples are shaped and formed and come into the kingdom. So at the same time, again, it can be very individualistic. It can create an elitism around Christian. You know, you become a Christian. You're the real Christians. And there are others who are not the real Christians, who aren't real disciples. And I think that uh, has problems. Now, as I think about those other, uh, those next three models, uh, one of the collaborative bridge building activities, uh, ministries I've been involved in is Alpha. How many of you have been exposed to the Alpha program? 
it's a, it's a 10 week course on the basics of Christian life. It brings together some of this evangelism as making disciples, evangelism as building and growing the church, and evangelism as uh, converting individuals. And uh, I was trained at Alpha at a conference held at St. Bartholomew's Church on Fifth Avenue in downtown Manhattan. St. Bart's, has anybody ever been there? Uh, it's a wonderful, historic Episcopal, Episcopalian church with very accepting attitudes toward uh, diverse views on sexuality, moral norms. It's a potpourri of a place where people come and go and a kind of a center and a hub for lots that's going on uh, in that part of New York City. And the gathering included lots of people across the denominational um, spectrum. And there we were at St. Mark's because Alpha was there having this charismatic kind of off the hook ministry time, he healing people. And, and I just sat there looking at this and I said, how is Alpha doing this? They're building bridges and they're working with everybody. And they've got a model that affirms and celebrates and pursues and promotes witness. And uh, it's really quite, quite remarkable to see they, they uh, uh, have, they, uh, have uh, as of last year, drawn 22 and a half mil million people into 66,000 courses in 169 countries speaking 112 languages. And they've gotten into the Catholic Church in a major way. Last, a couple of years ago, their, their national conference had 300 Catholics, including 45 archbishops, bishops and priests. And I, in my neighborhood, I've started leading Catholic Alpha. Um, launched a Catholic Alpha because all the seekers in my neighborhood are Catholics. And many Christians are. And so I found that that's the umbrella under which uh, I do it. But you know, Alpha can both polarize as well. It's charismatic emphasis. Some people don't like that. And then also some of the ways they reach Christians very non-confrontationally. In my first Alpha that I led, uh, I remember Melissa and Shauna, and uh, we went around and introduced ourselves, and Melissa said, I don't know why I'm here. I have so many doubts. I don't believe in God. I don't really even want to be here. I, you know, I probably won't ever be back. And that was her introduction. We went around, and we got to Shauna, and Shauna said, boy, I feel just like Melissa. I have so many doubts. I don't believe in God. I don't know how I got here. I don't think I want to even be here. And these two, and then she said, I am so excited. Somebody else feels that way. You know, they were like, and so they go out chatting. They walk out. I had a Christian come up to me afterwards who was sitting in the group, and they said, what is wrong with you? Are you helping people become atheists here? I mean, you didn't, you didn't say a thing. Come on now. And, uh, I, you know, here's what happened. Melissa and Shauna came back. And the second week, they still talked about atheism. The third week, a little bit. And then by the fourth weekend into the retreat, they were talking about Jesus. Amen. Because they had a chance to be who they were, where they were at. Amen. And once they could express it and experience <coughs> community, they were able to move forward toward Jesus. Very powerful illustration. But some people polarize over that. I mean, they wanted me to answer their every question in the first meeting, right? Which they never would have been bad. So Alpha is a wonderful sort of a picture of some of those uh, next models. Then evangelism as uh, uh, model five. So there's Alpha. Evangelism as acts of public witness, including storytelling of our experience and acts of mercy, justice, and peace. Right? Any act of witness is equated to an act of evangelism. Uh, certainly St. Bart's was a church that would have identified with this understanding of evangelism. And it has great power because it says our words, when not backed up by our actions, mean nothing. If we're not authentically, genuinely different in our witness and in the way that we serve the world, then what are we talking about? And what does our how does our gospel have any meaning? So very important. And yet sometimes when we define witness in that way, we can lose the verbal part. We can lose the, ex, you know, the kind of an invitation part to people to join God's kingdom and to trust Christ. And sometimes we can become activists uh, and centered on our own effort rather than centered on God and his intervention uh, with his rule, his reign, God's reign. I don't know how many of you, I, I know Garrett uh, does a lot with his or her 
the inclusive guide, language thing. The inclusive language. About it's uh, the, the the formal standard is we have to uh, use inclusive language when talking about humanity, but in reference to God, you can choose your pronoun. You, know, you can choose your voice. Yeah, that <laughs> that's okay? it. So. <laughs> okay, great. so that's okay then. Okay. <laughs> well, so how, however you talk about God, but God, <laughs> and uh, sometimes we lose that God-centeredness. So evangelism is public acts of witness, and then. Uh, and this is this was not something Billy Abraham looked at, but evangelism is alternative community. I think that understanding of evangelism has enjoyed a renaissance in these last years. People like uh, John Howard Yoder and Stanley Hauervoss, who really are talking about uh, the distinctive life of the community rooted in the spiritual, interpersonal, political, and economic ethic of Jesus. We look like Jesus. We're distinctive. We're a community uh, that lives a different life. And evangelism in this model is not about winning friends and influencing people and becoming relevant. It's about living the kind of distinctive lifestyle so people see and taste and feel kind of a, a life of sanctity, a life of that kind of holiness or beauty that attracts people that people long for. And I think that vision, you know, it's a fundamentally, evangelism is a fundamentally subversive activity born out of the cultivation of such deviant practices as sharing bread with the poor, loving enemies, refusing violence, telling the truth, and welcoming into fellowship women, Gentiles, the lame, the blind, and the prisoner, and the poor. More, uh, so uh, that kind of sanctity of life. I, you know, why was Mother Teresa such an evangelist in some ways more than Billy Graham was for a younger generation? That sanctity of life, that attractive beauty of holiness, that alternative life of the community that people long for, as represented in the Sermon on the Mount. But sometimes these alternative communities can look awfully homogeneous. And sometimes they can build high boundaries for anybody to get in. You can live this wonderfully distinctive lifestyle, but if nobody in the world sees it, or tastes it, or touches it, or can get in, then you have to have a stretch to call it genuine evangelism. Some of the strengths, but it has brought such a wonderful balance because evangelism isn't what we do, it's who we are. Right? Witness is who we are. And model seven, evangelism as the demonstration of God's power to heal, liberate, and deliver. Again, this is one that, at least among lots of uh, the networks I travel in, has enjoyed a rise to prominence over, these last, uh, over this last decade. Uh, John Wimber is probably a critical person in that whole process. Um, and now, you know, Al, the Alpha program, John Wimber went to England. I just did research in England on some of the missional church expressions in my sabbatical in the fall. And I was just stunned to see the impact of Alpha, stunned to see the impact of John Wimber, much more there than here, actually, in many ways. But still here as well. And uh, there's been this, you know, John Wimber was great because he took Pentecostalism and translated it into cool, laid-back, vernacular Southern California, right? <laughs> and it was a wonderful thing. He was a rock, uh, he'd been a rock band guy, and, uh, and he, uh, he just was so laid-back. He would pray for healing, but he never yelled, right? <laughs> never. <laughs> he never, goes, oh, no, no, never. You just never saw him do that. He would go like, come, come Holy Spirit. <laughs> well, cool. You know, I mean, it was that kind of like, uh, you know, very laid back. So he translated it and made it accessible for lots of people. And uh, I, got, I got to be part of his conferences and connected to him a little bit. And he taught and model, making manifest the presence and power of God's rule. Was his healing model was rooted in the kingdom of God, the reign of God uh, teaching. And... Uh, you know, this power emphasis has appealed to the powerless across the globe. Pentecostals, uh, Pentecostalism is the fastest growing segment of Christian faith. And a lot because it is a message about God's power for the powerless. Very powerful message. I won't say the word power anymore. But anyway, so uh, that's the seventh kind of model. 
And it has a wonderful uh, thing that it's given the church. But at the same time, it has a lot of dangers and a lot of excesses and can be used to manipulate people to raise money and can be used to promise miracles that never happened. And when sick people don't get well, the sick people get blamed. I mean, you come to get healing, you're not healed, and it's your fault. It's, uh, you leave worse than when you came. And uh, those kinds of practices, right, have often given it a bad name. Um, also, there's a lot more claim to what's happened in miracles than there are really credible miracles that have happened. But I have seen some, and I know God uses that. And so again, this is an area where we need to celebrate and affirm and critique in order to strengthen. So I had an experience of some of these last three models. Uh, I, I wish, I, you know, I've been studying communities, and I would love to talk about some of those, the neo-monastic communities, and some of the ways in which they're conceiving evangelism. You know, Shane Claiborne, uh, some of the folks, uh, the Rootbach community in North Carolina, uh, near Duke, uh, and a number of other expressions. But just to give one experience out of my own life that has a little bit of a funny ending, just because that would be good right now, uh, is I, I was the chairman of the Chicagoland Concerts of Prayer for Operation Harvest, a citywide uh, 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 gathering, a connecting of people, again, emphasizing this, can we collaborate? Can we build social capital? Can we connect with people? Can we affirm styles of evangelism that part of them we hate? But we can affirm part of what God does through them. So in the fall of 1987, we organized a concert of prayer in downtown Chicago and held the meeting in Moody Memorial Church large evangelical church started by D.L. Moody. We were 1,200 people across Baptist, Episcopalian, Catholic, Pentecostal, lots of denominations, Methodist. We were also uh, very diverse culturally, black and white, Hispanic and Native American, Asian and international. We opened in Spanish, Yoruba, Korean and English, and God was present. Worship and diversity coming together. Salsa music, gospel music. Boy, we went through the roof on the gospel choir music, and it was so uh, wonderful. Such a gift and experienced unity. Uh, one of the wonderful stories of the evening is that one of the churches that had split, a Pentecostal church uh, called Faith Tabernacle, had sp uh, split into Philadelphia Church. Faith Tabernacle had a byline on the radio. We're Faith uh, Tabernacle. We meet at Grace and Broadway, where the grace of God meets the Broadway of life. And this was one church that had split, right? And then the other church that had split off was Philadelphia Church, the Church of Brotherhood that had split off. And those two pastors came together that night and prayed and wept together to the great joy of everybody who had been connected to all of that kind of split. Just such a picture of what happens when we come together and heal and build bridges. But we also had a threat to our unity that night as well. We had said we're going to focus on what we have in common, the Lordship of Christ and reaching Chicago together. And uh, so everybody had promised we weren't going to do anything divisive. And one wonderful, I love him, Pentecostal Hispanic leader promised I will not speak in tongues. And he kept his promise. But when we got to the part of worship that he was leading about half week through, he interpreted our, you know, suggestion very liberally. He began to sing in tongues in Moody Memorial Church. And that is just not the done thing, mm -hmm. right? Right. That wasn't a helpful thing at that point. <laughs> They're a more dispensational kind of church. They believe mm -hmm. gifts have ceased. Yes. And so it was a great victory for him and a disaster for me and for us and those of us in the concert of prayer. So I was mortified. I went over to the senior pastor afterwards. I took his hand to shake it, and I'm about to apologize. And, uh, and the pastor said, wow, that was absolutely wonderful. My favorite part was when that Latino brother led us in Spanish in one step. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, whoa, I know some Spanish. And I didn't hear a syllable of Spanish, but maybe God translated Spanish, you know, tongues into Spanish for the senior pastor. Or maybe he took Spanish into tongues for me. I don't know. But whatever happened, God protected his unity because that kind of witness is on God's heart. That kind of appreciation and embrace and celebration and critique that strengthens. I would suggest that's how we can teach in seminaries. 
That's the framework of sort of teaching evangelism, where there's that kind of embrace and that kind of critique. Now, in, as a way to put all those uh, together, uh, I think Billy Abraham, you know, and many of us have been talking about the reign of God, the kind of eschatological frame for evangelism and how important that is. And the way in which all those different models, one way or another, feed into that bigger picture of God's reign inaugurated in the, death, in the life and birth and death and resurrection of Jesus and the gift of the Holy Spirit, inaugurated and to be fulfilled. Uh, that unity will be fulfilled. That John 17 prayer is an eschatological prayer, but it's already, when we see it and taste it now, it's the gospel. And it will only be fulfilled at the end. But that kind of kingdom of God, which doesn't just apply the kingdom of God to the social environment, the social gospel, but applies it to that whole view of history and the way God is at work in the middle of history to bring the end of history right to where we are, that final judgment in Jesus' death, that resurrection to new life in Jesus' resurrection, and the gift of the Spirit that begins the new creation here and now. And that's the gospel we proclaim. See, I did get a little bit to the message. And, but all those models are also swept up into that. You know, uh, proclamation and word, model one. The witness of good works and service, love, and justice, model five. And sons of God's power, model seven, are all dimensions of communicating and authenticating that message of God's reign, right? All right people who want to get rid of the works of God's power... I just want to say, wait a minute, if God's kingdom is breaking in, his reign, his end times reign, we taste it now, if that's our message, then there ought to be some evidence of that. And I think God's power in healing, but also God's power to bring unity in divided people, all those are signs of God's rule breaking into history. And they're the gospel and the way we proclaim the gospel. So I think there is a way to integrate. And then from that integration to affirm and critique, but in ways that celebrate and embrace and appreciate and build bridges and social capital and critique in order to strengthen. Well, I, I have one more place I'm going to go. But I want to hit the pause button and just let you respond a little bit. I, have, uh, I started at 7.15. I have till 8.30. So that's, that's our uh, place. But, so I want to hit the pause button right now and get us talking a little bit. Responses. What do you think? Are we missing some models? That, this was just one list. That's seven that I think have been prominent. But I think there's others. So anyway, go ahead. Anyway, my, my last challenge to you. So it looks like maybe I should have... Uh, I got rid of two parts of my talk, and, and then I left two. And then I was able to do one well. So I can't do this one well. Um, but I do think, actually, that often one of the most decisive issues in relation to whether evangelism becomes a cause for unity or a catalyst for disunity is the posture toward the prevailing cultures that each group or church tends to take. I often think it's that posture toward prevailing cultures. Now, I, as you read Niebuhr, so I mentioned Niebuhr before. Christ and Culture. It was a very helpful, groundbreaking book in 1951, but it's been critiqued a lot since, right? And so he had five types, and uh, he was able to get the Catholics with Aquinas. Um, here I can, I have them. Uh, so, so the Catholics were the synthesists, uh, radicals like whether Amish or fundamentalists or Tolstoy grouped a number of people together, but the against culture people, the accommodationists, not accommodationalists, but accommodationists uh, were kind of Schleiermacher, in Christ within culture, seeing Christ in the best of culture. The dualists were for, uh, for Niebuhr, the Lutherans. Uh, the conversionists were more the reformed. I kind of wonder when Methodists read Niebuhr, where do you see Methodists? Uh, depends on where in history you're asking about us. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's a good answer. It really that's does. A good yeah. yeah, that's a really good answer. Um, and I think that's one of the critiques of Niebuhr. Nobody fits a particular type. No movement does. Uh, everybody, you know, sp spills over. But Niebuhr knew that critique. He understood that in doing types, uh, 
He was trying to bridge subjective experience with institutional reality. And in doing that, he knew nobody could fit a type exactly, but it was helpful to think in that way. Um, he also, though, had one right answer, the conversionists. So most people read the book and decide they're conversionists. All the others got critiques, and that's the only one that didn't. Uh, but he's also been critiqued on his concept of culture, which is more of a before 70s mm -hmm. anthropological understanding of culture as some uh, abstract, monolithic thing out there, rather than situated, rather than diverse, uh, rather than uh, uh, you know always changing. And so Niebuhr kind of had this there's this monolithic culture we all interact with and relate to. Probably the most incisive critique of Niebuhr came from John Howard Yoder. And uh, Yoder basically said, uh, Niebuhr, you completely missed those of us who are Anabaptists and Mennonites. Uh, you, you call us the against culture people and that we tend to be uh, uh, legalistic. And uh, you need to understand that, uh, number one, everybody better be against culture on some level. And, uh, and, and number two, uh, not all of us are separated like the Amish if we're Mennonites. Not all of us have chosen to completely separate. Some of us have alternative communities prophetically engaged. And you completely missed that one. And that's a real problem. So lots of uh, critique. At the same time, there's that sort of fundamental insight that posture toward culture, even though it's not that good an idea, right? We shouldn't actually have one posture toward any culture or cultures. Mm -hmm. Because all cultures represent human effort, and we are made in the image of God, and we're fallen. And God gets involved in cultures as well. And so cultures can't be looked at monolithically. They're actually all mixes, and we don't need one posture. Uh, we need ways to discern our responses to, to the parts of culture. Uh, Niebuhr also it was a pretty Western Christendom model that he had. He worked out of a Christendom kind of mentality in a day when Protestant Christian faith was the dominant religion in the U.S. And uh, that was his social location. That was his vantage point. So there have been a lot of critique about Niebuhr, but I still think there's this fundamental insight when I look at the landscape that Churches that have a more negatively tipped posture toward the prevailing cultures of the people that they're trying to reach tend to have certain styles and approaches to evangelism mm -hmm. and certain attitudes toward churches that have the opposite or on mm -hmm. the spectrum are more positive toward the prevailing cultures of the people they're trying to reach. And so I've sort of played with that and tried to update Niebuhr, but I do it very... Um, tentatively and humbly because uh, everybody's tried to do that and uh, the test of any typology is whether anybody else ever uses it. <laughs> and uh, even John, John Howard Yoder developed his uh, three-part typology that I have not heard very many people quote. Yeah, have you ever used his typology, Dr. Yeah, no, no. right? Which, which one? Well, he had the three, he had uh, kind of institutional, sorry, I keep getting out of the way. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, he, he, uh, he still used Trelch uh, and the kind of the mystical and then sectarian and then institutional. And he basically had three types around Trelch's uh, three-part thing. But yeah, you know, only in one article. And uh, most people don't even know that he did it. <laughs> so Yoder critiqued, but then really, so here's mine that you can ignore after. <laughs> so, um, but I do think, what I want to leave you with is this insight that often our posture toward the prevailing cultures of the people we're trying to reach is, is a very decisive factor in whether we build social capital and trust each other or whether we break fellowship and distrust each other. Uh, mine is sort of based on if you're positive or negative posture toward prevailing cultures. Again, I said that's not a good place. We shouldn't all have a posture, just a uniform posture toward something out there. But churches do tend to have that. They tend to be oriented that way. And then the focus of mission, I think, Jesus as prophet ethical, Jesus as priest spiritual, Jesus as king political. I think we tend to see Jesus' mission, and then our mission, out of, we tend to emphasize or tip toward one of those three. Jesus as prophet ethical. Now obviously we want to integrate those. That's our call. They're all scriptural. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a tendency in churches to polarize around 
both our tip toward culture and then what we emphasize about Jesus' mission. And I think that can be helpful. Because of my time, I can't unpack my typology, but just give you a short talk about my conclusion. So I'm going to run you by progressive, Christ is prophet ethical, Christ in the best of culture, in the best of cultures, prevailing cultures. You notice I put a parentheses S. Populist, Christ is priest or spiritual, the seeker church, purpose driven church, Pentecostal church. Perfecting. And each one tends to have a characteristic understanding of evangelism. So, and then, so progressive populist, and then negative posture toward prevailing cultures again, a tendency that churches and institutions have. Communitarian, there's your witness. Separatist, more fundamentalist. And then reforming. Christ is king political. Still a little more negatively tipped toward culture. So here's what I want to do. A lot of why I've been so, a lot of why I get stuck on Nibor is because of my own life. And this is kind of the final challenge I want to give you. Uh, if theology is experience, which can't be denied on some level, certainly some theology is experience. Uh, it affects our grids. Could our own journey become a great resource in how we teach our students to be leaders and affirmers and practice critique that strengthens instead of dismisses? So my journey, in brief, just as, a, just as one um, example, I've had to struggle in my own journey to make sense of a very diverse set of experiences in a lot of different churches. And I bet I'm not alone. I may be in some cases. But I bet there are some of you who also have somewhat of a diverse journey. I've also had to deal with the issue of, and so often the people that get most negative about a particular style of evangelism are people that were exposed to it and hurt by it when they were younger. Mm -hmm. The most negative people about evangelism that's at all confrontational or evangelism that's at all sort of uh, very bold, the most negative people are people who have been hurt by it and often grew up in environments where that was the only model they were exposed to. And in order to teach and affirm and celebrate, I would suggest we often need healing in our own selves. And we need to get in touch with the resources that our own journey gives us to teach evangelism. I know for me, I was shaped in a sort of a reforming kind of a group, InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, and I love the whole life and the whole mind. I love, we had a vision for the whole university to be transformed. We weren't just interested in souls saved. We wanted, a whole, we wanted the kingdom to affect the whole university. And that helped me, but sometimes we got lost in that. Sometimes we were not agents of transformation. We were agents of information. And we confused the two. And I think sometimes people can do that. So then I went in, uh, I have also been part, I've been a part of just a number of different churches, the kind of populist church of Willow Creek. And I got, you know, I was able to, uh, you know, I just had an experience of helping plant one of their sites and, and learned a lot through it and loved their heart for people. Loved their heart for people who don't know Jesus. I love their emphasis on that and their understanding of mission, but I also saw sometimes that their church could become so much like the culture. They could reproduce consumerist disciples who went from church to church where the teaching was good and the pastor was funny and all of that. I mean, that's what happens in the consumer church, but powerful at the same time. And I, I, I'm an Anglican priest, and I've been involved in some of these kinds of splits that have happened try to, you know, stand for orthodoxy. But there's been such a focus on the true church versus the false church, and the splits continue. The church I was connected with, I didn't choose my connection, I chose my local church, and then my local church chose our connection. But it was Anglican Mission in America. And they've already split from their Rwandan diocese, then they went to Congo, then they went back to Rwanda, then they went up to England. And then they had an internal split. And they're the true church, praise God. <laughs> praise God, but they get little. And they build a fortress that can never shrink. And yet there's something powerful in situations of persecution and in times in which the gospel is lost of churches being faithful and emphasizing that and being a witness in that way, right? 
I grew up in a United Church of Christ and a Unitarian Church. And honestly, I didn't find the spiritual sustenance I was looking for, but I found a lot of values I loved and a lot about witness that I loved. And a lot of my life has been getting a spiritual center in some ways elsewhere and yet coming back to the integration and the embrace of the values I grew up with that were so good and so powerful. For me, there's been an involvement in a black church that was transforming. And it was very important in my journey. And it's, again, one of sort of a, it was a more populous church, more tip, positive toward the culture. So I, I feel like as I looked at the type, I've had significant experience in almost every one of those ways God has often worked in the church. And I, that's made it hard for me. And I've needed healing at points in order to embrace some of the things that hurt me. Uh, and I guess that's a question I want to end with. Do any of us need healing? Do any of us need to come to terms with our background and ways we've been hurt or styles of evangelism that have hurt us? Are there ways that God wants to make us whole so that we can help bridge and build social capital and unify the church so it can be that John 17 witness. So we can at least taste the eschatological unity that God is leading us all for. Pretty good. Mm -hmm. It's only 8.30, but I don't leave you much time to talk about that one.